we continue to prepare for the second coming of Christ. We continue to prayer to prepare for his coming. It is Advent. We are preparing for his coming. And St. Paul, the blessed Apostle Paul, is reminding us to judge not before the time until the Lord come. And that is because either until our last dying breath, our, our end is not determined. Our end is not determined until our last dying breath. The Lord does not come to judge us until it's the time for our particular judgment, which is when we die. And otherwise, the last judgment has not yet come. And so, you know, in, until you take your last breath, you are not perfected. You are not complete. There is always another decision to make. And we can't get discouraged when we fall into sins. We can't get discouraged when we fall into habitual sins. Because there's always this moment right now to make a firm resolution, a firm purpose of amendment, to sin no more. I mean, and give myself to confession, and with the grace of God, I will sin no more. But first, we have to acknowledge that we are sinners. And that is what St. John the Baptist came to help people to see, that they needed to repent of their sins because one was coming after him who was greater than him and who was before him, someone who would baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost. We have to acknowledge that we're sinners and we have to be accountable. We are living through very difficult times, not only in the world, I mean, the secular world is very disturbed. The secular world is very worried about all sorts of things, whether it's a third world war, which maybe we've been in the midst of for a couple of years now already, whether it's war, whether it's fabricated situation where we're experiencing shortages for some other purpose bring us down, whatever it is, whether it is, uh, whether it is uh, all sorts of deceptions of every kind. The world is in a, in a fog of confusion and fear and chaos. The Lord brings order out of chaos. We can live in the midst of this chaos, but we can get our own lives in order, and we need to do so because... You know, whatever chastisements we're living through, we could blame it on, on the faithful who have not been faithful. And, you know, many, many of us have had times in our lives when we've not been faithful, but here we are today. We've decided to come to Mass. We're going to get our lives right. We're going to get right with God. We're going to start going to confession. We're going to start praying the rosary every day. But we, we need to be accountable, and we need to do that. We need to acknowledge when we have been unjust toward God. So there will be no justice in this world as long as there is un injustice rendered to God. So we need to be just with God. What does it mean to be just with God? Well, we need to be accountable for our sins. So... If you have missed even one Sunday Mass, not because you are sick, if you're sick, you're excused. If something happens beyond your control, you're excused. But if you've missed a Sunday Mass, and you could have gone, but you decided not to, or if you've been away from the church and you're coming back, well, you should know that you, are, you should not be receiving Holy Communion until you go to confession and confess that you missed Mass. Or maybe you missed Mass for several years. And I'm telling you that not to be mean, not to punish you, but to save you. Because I love you. I want you to have every opportunity that I did not have. You know, parents often say that to their children. Nobody ever told me as a young man that I had to go to confession. 
And I know that all those years I was away from the church, I was clueless. I would just show up for Mass from time to time and go to communion because that's what you do, right? You grow up Catholic, you go to Mass, you go to communion, right? No, you don't. You don't go to communion unless you're prepared to go to communion. You have to prepare to go to communion. Otherwise, we're eating and drinking condemnation on ourselves. I don't want anyone to be condemned. I want you to be blessed. I don't want to feed you poison food. I want to feed you the food of heaven. I want your souls to be blessed by Holy Communion. So if you've missed Mass on a Sunday, don't go to Communion until you go to Confession. If you missed Mass on the Immaculate Conception a week and a half ago, on Wednesday, December 8th, that was a holy day of obligation. If you did not go to Mass that day, even if just out of negligence, maybe you didn't know, don't go to Communion today. That's the consequence. You need to go to confession first. Otherwise, you're eating and drinking condemnation on yourself. And I don't want you to be condemned. I love you. I want communion to be the food of angels and the medicine of immortality. But why are we experiencing this chastisement in the world? Well, the faithful have been unfaithful. Think of, think of all those eras in the last couple generations where Catholics have not knelt before the Lord. Or Catholics have handled sacred vessels when they should not have been touching them. Or when communion has been given indiscriminately in the hand and even to the unfaithful and even to those who aren't Catholic. And all the particles of the Blessed Sacrament that have been fallen on the floor, vacuumed up, swept up, mopped up, and washed into the sewage, or into the dumpster. So, for that alone, it's no wonder there's a chastisement in the world. All the neglect of teaching the faith to our young generations and all those Catholics who've grown up and, and don't even know their faith or don't believe it or those Catholic institutions that are actually teaching heresy and people are paying a fortune to send their kids to learn heresy and to lose their souls. They're paying a fortune. People are getting rich using the name of Catholic. People are getting rich by betraying the Catholic Church. Not to mention all the politicians who so brazenly call themselves Catholic and betray Catholics with every decision, practically every decision they make. It's no wonder there's a chastisement in the world. But you see, we're all guilty because we're all sinners. But our Lord wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. He wants us to be healed of the wounds of sin. He wants us to look into his face in the beatific vision. He wants us in heaven with him. But there are so many people that are burdened by their sins and living without hope and despairing, afraid to look upon the face of God, afraid to set foot in the church, even when the doors are wide open. They're so afraid of being rejected. And yet, we've all been rejected recently, told that we don't have a place, told that we're not wanted, but we don't believe that. And we know that's just a temptation. That is just a temptation. It's not the truth. The devil wants us to believe that we are cast off, that we're unwanted, that we're not welcome. But we know that's a temptation. It's not true. We are wanted. We do belong. But we all need to get our lives right with God, all of us. And 
We need to do so not just for ourselves, but for all of our loved ones, all those entrusted to our care, whether it's your employees or whether it's your family, whether it's your students, whether it's your patients, whether it's your clients, whether it's your neighbors, your classmates, because the whole world is affected by how the faithful live their lives. When we render justice to God, then justice can reign in the world. But if injustice is given to God, then there will be injustice in the world. And we cannot say that we're working for justice when, under the banner of Christ, we're fighting for the rights of mortal sin. You cannot fight for the rights of mortal sin. Sin has no rights. Heresy has no rights. Error has no rights. A lie has no rights. And we should not be paying anyone money to teach our children lies and heresy and mortal sin. But we have to get our own lives right because until the last breath we take and the last breath that all, everyone, even those we think are our enemies, those we think that are ruining the world, or ruining our city, or ruining our country, all of those people, till their last breath, have an opportunity and, and have the Lord pummeling them with grace in order to change their minds in order to turn their lives around. Now many of us have turned our lives around. We know what it's like to be on the other side of things. And we're so grateful that God had mercy on us and brought us to our senses, brought us back to our knees, to praying, to living a prayerful sacramental life. Where would we be otherwise? You can't hardly imagine what that must be like. So we have to be grateful to God. We need to be humbled as we prepare for Christmas. So if you've not been to confession for a while, get to confession. You know, we have confessions here five days a week. And I can't always get to everyone. Sometimes the line is too long. But even so, you just need to get to confession. If, if you, you know, if you... If you live near a parish where there's confessions, just go to confession. Get your confession done. Or you can wait in line here. And I'll get to as many people as I can. We need to prepare for the sake of the whole world. You know, as the, as the church goes, so goes the world. And the church is really hurting right now. Really struggling. And really, uh, in, in so many ways, um, you know, we, we need to strengthen her. This is a time for saints. And you might, you might think out of a false sense of humility that you could not be a saint. But that is not humility. You have a duty to be a saint. It would be an injustice to God if you were not, if you did not strive to be a saint. You have to desire to be a saint. You have to pray that God will make you a saint. Not so that you could have this statue in the church. And you don't want to be planning your statue. That's not the reason why you want to be a saint. You don't want to be thinking, okay, I want my statue to be posed like this, and it's really going to, like, everyone who looks at it is going to be just inspired. No, you don't want to think about that. You can plan your funeral. You know, you want to, you want to think, you know, you want to be planning for your funeral. And to think about how you will edify everyone by your, you know, by the, the beauty that the church offers, you know. Because the funeral is not, the funeral is not a place to express yourself. The funeral is a place where the church prays for you, for the deceased. But even so, we need to strive to be a saint, and it is not being prideful to want to be a saint. It's your duty. It's your duty 
to want to be a saint. And God will give you everything you need to get there. And he will humble you. Because you, if, you, if you try to be a saint, you're going to feel like a failure. And if you feel like a failure in trying to be a saint, give thanks to God. That's exactly where you should be. I am a failure. Thank you, God. It's wonderful to be a failure in that way. Because in being a failure and striving to please God, not a failure because, because you relish sin, but because you're humbled again and again and again, and you feel like you're making no progress, which actually means that you are. Humbled in the sight of God, and you're beloved of God. God, God loves those who keep trying, even when they fail. So we shouldn't be afraid of God. We need to have a proper fear of God. But we shouldn't be afraid of God, and that's why he comes as a baby. We can look into the sweet face of a baby and see a foretaste of the beatific vision, looking into the face of God. And who's afraid of a baby? Who's afraid of a baby? Baby's so sweet, so lovable, and that's how our Lord came to us. Sweet and lovable and willing to suffer for us. So we're in, we're in for some suffering ahead. I think that's just the way it's going to be. But it's okay. We'll get through it. And we'll still have the warmth of family love and friends. We'll share what we can. And we'll just keep going and not be afraid. Amen. Amen.